In dreams, I touch my ghosts more gently, lest like kisses they come back outside of sleep, gliding on the once and future ocean silently, save for water slapping at the bent boards of memoried hulls, but for the fitful snapping of canvas lulled in forgotten breezes. Ghost sounds, hidden from all but the watcher, restless and unconsoled, on the crushed detritus sand of times that might have continued had half the hands not moved counter to everybody's hopes and expectations. It continues with decorated cups, holding tea that smokes like the cigarettes we shared. The cold rain on the summer afternoon driveway outside the window, our still unmade bed that seemed so big and so small. We drove the curving county two-lane, temporary fog and ancient trees our witnesses, especially to rumple those sheets and let the duvet slide to the worn wooden boards. Now we act civilly. Observe confused rituals with your mother's fine china and bag tea from the highway convenience store. Triangles of toast holding generic jam from a garishly labeled plastic jar. The tablecloth is hand embroidered heirloom cotton, a great grandmother's months of work. Your blouse is roughly tossed across the top of an empty chair's ladder back. We've walked your father's woods on winter days, the bare black bark rising like bars containing us as though our hearts were on exhibit. But today we will take our cups and return to bed. You propped against the headboard in gray camisole, I lying reversed next to you, one hand kneading your left leg while kneading you, both speaking of affairs far smaller than our time together. Tomorrow we will travel south through yesterday's woods, pause to share the shore of the once and future ocean. It will be raining when we reach the city. Strangers with eyes downcast beneath umbrellas will pass each other in barred crosswalks. When the Waiting for the Bus reading series was running in Chicago, uh, every October we would do a thing called the Poetry Wheel, where we would read around the table one poem, and your particular poem had to bear some relationship to the previous poem, however tenuous it might have been. Uh, in this case, uh, a poem that has to do with clocks. And that was totally by accident. I picked these poems last week. <laughs> the boy with a clock on his back can't hear the ticking, but feels the motions of the hand's movement as he walks down the alley. Walks on mud-covered cobbles, but doesn't leave footprints. Nothing to say he's been here until he steps into the puddle that's waiting for him, where he leaves short-lived ripples and waves on the water, making the sky and walls reflected on the surface shimmer as though they were on fire for one brief moment. But he doesn't notice this, or that his shoes are now wet. He only sees the line where alley and plaza meet, the door goal on the other side, while he prays silently to do this one thing right today, to be safe from the burning scorn and ridicule that drip from his mother's lips like a rabid dog's foam-flecked blind anger, to be a good and acceptable son, to be on time. Thank you.